billing applications. Can the online people Email. see us Email. now? Email. Are they connected to us? Yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and start it. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to IFPRI, uh, International Food Policy Research Institute, where this is happening face-to-face, uh, -face, but we also have online participants. My name is Suresh Babu. I am a senior research fellow and head of capacity strengthening at IFPRI. Uh, and I, I've been here for a while. Uh, I will be the moderator for today for this uh, launch event. Um, uh, IFPRI and I particularly are very happy to host this event. Uh, and welcome you officially uh, to launch this newest member of the Humanitarian Standards Partnership SEEDS, the standards for supporting crop-related livelihoods and in emergencies. We have now about 150 people, is that right, and registered online, and, and, and they are connecting with us. And we have about 20 to 25 people here in the room. This is the fourth and final regional launch of SEEDS. SEEDS held one event uh, in November in Rome at the Food Security Cluster Global Partners Meeting. Another one in December, hosted by ICRC in Nairobi. And the third one, and the last one last week in, in Bangkok, hosted by World Vegetable Center. Through all these events, we have around 300 participants, uh, and we have already have more than 1,000 downloads. That's that's what I hear uh, of the AND book. That's, that's uh, wonderful. So we are thrilled to see such an interest in this new tool. Um, I'm particularly interested in seeds because about uh, 30 years ago, I was asked from Cornell University to go to Malawi, uh, where droughts and you know um, kind of famine kind of situation was really looming. And I was asked to go there and help the country. Um, I was called food security advisor. I was very young. Uh, and in 1991, we faced the drought. 60% of maize yields went down. And that is real drought, famine kind of situation. So I was asked to calculate how much food we need, the basic information, uh, where should the food go when we uh, get the food, uh, will we get the food commercially or food aid, whom should we contact, all this basic information the government was struggling to have, and I was put in the middle of it. And at the same time, uh, we were also asking ourselves, what can the farmers and, and the rural households can do when while we are waiting for the food to arrive? And that's when I thought some kind of this emergency action plan for agriculture would help. And now I see the seeds uh, document, I realize, wow, this is exactly what we were planning to have at that time or should have at that time to work with, right? But of course, we scrambled, we imported some sweet potato, you know, cuttings from, from Zambia and all these things uh, to go along in fighting, you know, drought induced famine conditions so so i'm glad that i'm i'm part of this launch because uh, this is something that i look forward to in terms of using it i understand this has been a truly collaborative effort um, uh, people coming together the scientists experts uh, ngos practitioners on the ground policymakers uh, coming together in order to contribute not only to the content but also commenting on the earlier drafts and what you see is the final uh, collective wisdom from not only from the literature experience from the past, but also the the field tested knowledge that you have. So uh, this is this is an exciting moment personally for me, and also to look forward to using the manual. But before we go on, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we'll start with our panel today. Uh, we will talk about. We'll have four speakers lined up. Who will introduce? I will introduce in a moment. As uh, your questions rise as they present, please go ahead and pop them in the. Q&A, this is particularly for the people who are online. Um, do that in Q&A um, uh, uh, chat uh, session there. Uh, and please hold them. If you are in person here, please hold them until we finish the panel, this panel presentations. We'll have about 30 minutes at the end to get your questions. Please do not put your questions in the in, uh, for the panel in the chat. Right? That's a specific instruction we are giving. Don't put it on the chat, but only in Q&A as we will only be monitoring Q&A uh, questions. Now, I'm delighted to introduce four members of this panel, and we have Racy Anderson um, for, from SEEDS, who is a SEEDS coordinator, who will, will speak first. And we have Jan Maro, Jan in the room. Oh, right, Jan, I should have said hello to you. I didn't see you, sorry, Jan. Uh, agriculture team lead with the uh, Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance at USAID. And we have uh, Julie uh, Ede, 
Global Technical Director for Agriculture and Livelihoods at CRS, Temba Sibanda, Chief of Party uh, uh, for Activating Markets and Agricultural Livelihoods at Norwegian Refugee Council in Iraq. He is coming to you from Iraq online. So we have um, also got Aaron Gershowitz here sitting at the back. Uh, NRC's Institutional Partnership Advisor here in the room with us. We will say some connecting words uh, to Tembe when, when we come there. Uh, but let's start with Racy, who is going to give us uh, more information about SEEDS standards. Uh, Racy, please. You will, you will use this, right, sir, yourself. Thanks, Suresh. Thanks, everyone, for being here. So it's been a real pleasure for me to coordinate the project over the last three years with the steering group. We have one member of the steering group here with us today, Temba Sabanda, and a former steering group member, Adam Rydell, here in the office, in the room. Um, so really glad to do that. Also have been supported the whole way by my colleague, Anne Rade from Tufts, who is the brilliant mastermind behind all of these, um, these launch events. So I'm thrilled to share SEEDS with you today. So SEEDS is a set of evidence-based international principles and minimum standards that support the design, implementation, and evaluation of crop-related responses. It allows you to determine if a crop-related response is appropriate, necessary, and feasible, and it helps you prioritize which crop-related response area might achieve livelihood objectives given the context. It also helps you track alignment of your project with minimum standards and the core humanitarian standards and provides tools for measuring impact from crop related crisis response. SEEDS is the newest member of the Humanitarian Standards Partnership, a collaboration between standards initiatives to harness evidence, expert op opinion and best practices and to use this knowledge to improve quality and accountability in humanitarian response. SEEDS fills a critical gap in humanitarian standards by providing guidance specific to crop production before, during, and after emergencies, and supporting alignment to crop-related responses with the core humanitarian standard. It will be a great companion to other standards. In particular, it, com it complements LEGS, the livestock, livestock Emergency Guidelines and Standards, which provides minimum standards on livestock responses and livestock producers, as you know, also produce crops very often. So why use seeds? As you all undoubtedly know, around the world, millions of people who are vulnerable to crisis rely heavily on crop production to support their livelihoods. According to the Global Humanitarian Overview for 2023, about two thirds of refugees and asylum seekers originate from countries with food crises. And by the end of 2022, at least 220 222 million people across 53 countries were expected to face acute food insecurity. So many of these people produce food for themselves, for their communities, for the food supply chain, and they generate income if they sell food they have produced. During a crisis, crop production and many other associated services that make crop production possible may be disrupted, making it more difficult for people to meet their food and income needs. Many of you have, I'm sure, seen this firsthand. Using SEEDS minimum standards in your projects can ensure the best possible programming and keep people from starving, from adopting negative coping mechanisms, and from migrating. Crop-related crisis responses that use SEEDS principles and standards offer people assistance that can have sustained livelihood impacts. Response aligned with SEEDS principles and standards can help reduce the impact of future crisis, support a more sustainable use of live natural resources, and enhance market linkages and viability. So who is SEEDS for? Anyone who is involved in crop-related response can use SEEDS, but it is most useful for agriculture experts who are unfamiliar with humanitarian principles, programming and evaluations, or on the flip side of that coin, humanitarians who are unfamiliar with crops and effective programming to support crop-based livelihoods before, during, and after emergencies. So SEEDS covers all types of crops, perennial, annual, and horticulture, and all types of emergencies, rapid onset, slow onset, and complex. To get started with SEEDS, first the, the, the first three chapters, which underpin the SEEDS minimum standards and an effective response. 
These chapters explain the seed's evidence-based, livelihoods-based, and rights-based approach, as well as the importance of crop-related crisis response to livelihoods. These chapters also introduce the seed's principles. These principles are fundamental concepts that underpin all crop-related responses and support the best possible programming. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. They build on seeds evidence-based, rights-based, and livelihoods-based approach and complement the foundations of humanitarian response, humanitarian charter, the protection principles, and the core humanitarian standard. They do this by highlighting concepts that ensure crop production has livelihood benefits. These principles apply in all humanitarian concepts and should be considered in all types of crop-related responses. The five principles are use livelihoods-based programming, use a participatory approach in all aspects of crisis response, commit to preparedness and early action, consider climate change and minimize environmental impacts, and establish coordinated responses. After the SEEDS principles, the handbook goes into the minimum standards and practical tools for initial assessment, three technical response areas, and impact-oriented monitoring and evaluation. These minimum standards were selected using an approach focused on evidence, livelihoods, and rights. They are guided by a systematic review of over 250 evaluations of crop-related responses in humanitarian crises, as well as feedback from hundreds of experts around the world during our global public consultation in 2021. The standards are based on a livelihoods approach because crop-related crisis response supports livelihoods and a rights-based approach that encourages participation, empowerment, accountability, and non-discrimination when delivering crop-related responses. So let's take a look at the structure of each of the standards. Each standard has a qualitative statement, um, this, which is the standard itself. It has key actions that are practical steps to help you attain the standard and guidance notes, additional information to support the key actions in the same fashion. So this structure is the same fashion as other HSP standards. Let's take a quick look at each of the standards. First, we have initial assessment minimum standards that cover teaming, cover timing and team competencies, assessment approach, questions and methods, and response area selection. Tools in this chapter will direct you to choose one or more response areas. Then we have seed and seed system minimum standards related to assessment and planning, technical options and timing, systems-based assistance, crop, vari crop and variety choice, and seed quality. The tools, equipment, and other non-seed input minimum standards mirror those of seed and seed systems, directly covering assessment and planning, technical options and timing, services and system support, and choice and quality. So for crop-related infrastructure minimum standards, they cover assessment and planning, technical specifications, location, lifetime, and timing. For each of the three response areas, SEEDS includes practical tools to help you achieve minimum standards in each area. The first tool that it includes are decision trees, such as this. It also includes timing tables that help you determine when different technical options would be appropriate they also include tables of disadvantages and advantages of different technical options in each response area. So the last set of standards in the final chapter, last but not least, is the SEEDS impact-oriented monitoring and evaluation standards. So these are the first of their kind in HSP, expanding on the key indicators we see in other HSP handbooks and providing minimum standards for participatory approaches project objectives, process monitoring, indicators, and two types of evaluations, end of project reviews, and participatory impact evaluation. This chapter also provides tables to support aligning your crop-related response with the core humanitarian standard on the standard on quality and accountability and emergency assistance. Okay, so to wrap up, let's talk about access. How do you get the handbook? Like other HSP minimum standards, we were really focused on inclusion and making access easy. So there's a number of ways you can access it. The easiest way is to, cop to get a copy is to download it from our website. We'll place that link in the chat for those of you who are online. You can also view and search seeds alongside other HSP handbooks in the interactive 
handbook platform of Sphere. And you can download the HSP app if you want to take Seeds to the Field with you. If you're like me and you want a hard copy of the book, uh, you can purchase one through Practical Action Publishing, which is our publisher, or if you're in the room today, we have books for you at the end of the session. So links to all these options are available on our website, and I will pass it back to Suresh. Thank you, Desi. Um, yeah, since uh, we have to use the microphone because online participants are listening. Um, thank you, Desi. Once again, a wonderful overview of the SEEDS uh, uh, document itself and also how we can get access to it. Now let me ask uh, Jan to um, come and um, uh, give a few words about his perspective. Jan? Thank you, uh, Suresh. Uh, oh dear. Oh good, good. I, I, was, I was hoping it wasn't going to just be that, that picture of me up there the whole time. Um, no, it's great to see so many folks here in in the room this morning. Um, you know, we don't have too many in-person uh, meetings going on, so that that's really exciting and and great to see so many folks online. Um, considering this is now the fourth and final of the launches, to still see so many people interested, um, so that's great. So good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of you that are um, on there. I did also want to thank Ifpri for hosting us in person here. So thank you, Suresh, for. Um, making that happen. Um, and also a thanks to uh, Tufts and Anne and Racy and the rest of the steering committee um, over these past few years working on um, pulling this together. Um, I remember when this was uh, first sort of a little kernel of an idea um, back in uh, OFDA, OFTA, as it was in those days, and uh, you know, the sort of vision that was coming together, um, and now to actually see it you know, in a tangible actual um, book and, and you know, be able to, to use that going forward is, is really quite exciting um, for me and my team um, at, at BHA. As the, uh, you know, world's largest humanitarian um, donor, BHA um, in USAID, of course, is very uh, excited to be able to, um, you know, develop and commit to these uh, standards and guidelines, um, as uh, Racy was explaining, you know, this is part of the HSP. It fits in with uh, the Sphere uh, standards, and we've been very um, pleased and and uh, sort of dedicated to making sure that it aligns well with legs, because we know, um, as as Racy has already noted, that so many of the the programs that uh, you know, our partners are, and community of practice are implementing with the beneficiaries um, are are integrated um, in that way. And, you know, I think back when I was a, a field practitioner in, in my early uh, days in the career, and I see some of my, my former NGO colleagues here in the room, um, and we were already reminiscing a little bit uh, earlier, you know, it's it's a, it was a, an evident um, gap that there wasn't a, a particular uh, book or standard or guideline that we could go to for these types of agricultural programs. And you know, you're often you're talking to each other or asking the cluster, is there a, a best practice for this, or you know, where do we get information on this? And you know, when we were writing our proposals for for funding, it was you know, we'll, we'll pilot this and we'll pilot that, hoping that it was something you know that was going to have a, a, a decent outcome. Um, and I think what's what's really exciting for us as BHA is that it's not just an output um, based uh, process now as we look at these agricultural and, and crop based programming, but now we can actually um, know for certain that the types of uh, projects that we're going to be, we as a donor funding and, you know, all of you as the community practice implementing with beneficiaries um, are based off of solid evidence. Um, that we know now that the, the the dollars we're sending are actually going to have the the impact that we intend, um, and so I think that's really exciting for us. Um, you know, as as the donor, um, looking at it from the best bang for our buck perspective. Um, I think I'll stop there and uh, hand back to you, Suresh. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, yeah, please take your seat. Thank you. And once again, we'll bring them the panels back, as I said, uh, for more questions and interaction with you all online as well as in person. But let me at this stage um, is uh, Julie Ide here. Uh, Julie, please uh, come. Julie Ide is from CRS, right? So I already introduced you before. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, um, I'm not sure if the that might be the notes for the. 
Is this the script? Yeah, it will be like two. Just one second. Yeah, that sounds, that's yeah. great. Okay, thank you. And um, good morning, everyone, and um, good afternoon and good evening for those who are online. So I'd also like to thank Eve Pre for the invitation um, to today's session and to, to Racy and Anne as well for the work in coordinating. Um, I am most excited about SEEDS and what I think it can offer in terms of strengthening coordination of our efforts, especially along the, the continuum of humanitarian to development programs. Um, I think they really offer a tool for humanitarian and development actors at the country level to work together and collaborate in conducting assessments. Um, in agreeing on programmatic interventions that are going to make sense, engaging with local institutions and learning together about what is actually achieving the results that we're aiming for. So SEEDS with its livelihood objectives, principles and standards creates a common language for all of us to work together in actually sharing data and information strengthening our preparedness efforts and strengthening market systems for more resilient livelihoods. So for me, this really offers a renewed opportunity for engaging local institutions. CRS works closely with our Caritas partners and non-church partners um, in our humanitarian responses, mainly because they are usually in the communities that are most affected. And they are quick to be able to assess the needs and to mobilize resources in response. But we also recognize the important role of local government institutions and market actors in preparedness and coordination to ensure that there are strong systems for enabling resilient livelihoods, again, along that continuum of the response and the development work. So I think SEEDS really reinforces for us again, the localization agenda. And it's calling for participation, it's calling for coordination and preparedness. And so this is really going to help strengthen and sustain these systems. So I see a lot of value in organizations like CRS and, and other NGOs in introducing SEEDS in these coordination platforms and engaging local institutions um, in building a common understanding and practice of how we can collectively support livelihoods across the humanitarian and development nexus. So SEEDS guidance also resonates with CRS's global food crisis strategy. In our strategy, we are looking at both responding to immediate needs as well as defining the medium to long-term investments needed to strengthen food systems. So we're trying to be more intentional about how we do this, about our immediate response and how it's connected to those systems and where possible implementing through those systems required for addressing the underlying drivers of food insecurity. So SEEDS is going to help our teams do this in three ways. Through its emphasis on a livelihoods and market-based response, by encouraging teams to consider climate change and protecting the ecosystem services that are critical to livelihoods, and driving the generation of evidence to contribute to important data and information systems. So firstly, the SEED's principle to have a livelihoods-based response encompasses the importance of market systems for both the formal and informal um, systems in the immediate response as well as critical as critical pieces to improve food systems. So in the midst of this crisis that we're all uh, um, analyzing, we're hearing a lot about the focus on access to fertilizer. However, for a crop-based response, SEEDS recognizes the broader needs of households that have agriculture-based livelihoods. The handbook guides responders to assess all the resources critical to production, such as land and water resources, and understanding the pre-crisis market characteristics related to all inputs required for crop, produ crop production. 
So for example, CRS has done a lot of work in designing the seed and voucher fair methodology over the last couple of decades. We've really tried to move away from direct distributions into a market-based response. However, this very much has become a bit of a um, um, uh, sort of business as usual approach for CRS. So I think with the SEEDS handbook, it gives us this response area identification tool, which really will help responders have a systematic way of addressing what is the most appropriate response and not always just going to a knee jerk sort of what we're used to. But most importantly, there's a focus on the participatory impact assessments, which will help all responders understand did that selected response actually create the, the outcome that we were looking for? So secondly, the seed principle number four, where fo we're focused on climate change and environmental impacts, this is also critical to the current food crisis. There has not been enough emphasis on protecting the restoration of land and the ecosystem services that sustain livelihoods over the long term. Our livelihoods and landscapes platform has been supporting farming households, communities, and governments to invest in sustainable production and restoring landscapes. And we have evidence that this work increases soil fertility, water resources, and can reduce a community's need for food assistance in a crisis. So again, access to fertilizer is useful, but seeds can help responders really make sure that they maintain a focus on healthy soils, even in an emergency response. And finally, the third seeds principle that I think is really interesting, especially for CRS, on the focus on preparedness and early action, as well as, again, this focus on participatory impacts, monitoring and evaluation. This really resonates with CRS's interest in data and information systems and how we can strengthen these systems. So we're investing in a number of tools that help us understand the market impacts of different crises and also um, tracking the shocks and resilience trends among households that are mul experiencing multiple events. So one of these tools, the monthly interval resilience analysis called MIRA, collects high frequency data that is shared with communities to empower a localized response. So this is an example of a system that can not only support preparedness and, and early action, but it's a system that can be strengthened by the SEED's participatory impact assessments. So we can feed that data back into that system and, and um, really understand what's happening as an outcome. So generally, I'm really eager to uh, build the awareness of the SEED's principles and standards with our country program staff, our local partner staff, and I think it will be especially important to continue to encourage our teams and our colleagues to work in coordination with others when we apply it. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. That is wonderful. Uh, let me now um, go online to Temba. Before I do that, we do have um, uh, Aaron Gershowitz here. Um, we will connect us to Temba in Iraq. Uh, please, Aaron. Sure, thank you so much, Suresh, and good morning, everyone in the room, and uh, good afternoon and evening to all online. We're all, I guess, become used to operating in multiple time zones, so we have to say that each time. Um, I'm new to seeds and to the whole agricultural area, so not able to comment on that at all, but would just like to um, express the uh, representing the Norwegian Refugee Council NRC's office here in the U.S. I'm very pleased to represent the organization at this event to launch SEED standards. NRC has long recognized the importance of developing common standards for the implementation of humanitarian assistance to ensure the quality and consistency of humanitarian work in so many diverse and challenging contexts. Um, we have worked closely for many years with the other uh, standards bodies, including SPHERE and my education colleagues working with INEE. So we certainly recognized when the SEEDS uh, was proposed that this would be that we would like to take an active role in the development of these standards. And we have been involved starting with my colleague Thomas Oholm in our headquarters since 2019. We're looking forward, of course, to 
work closely with the SEEDS team, with USAID, other partners throughout the world to implement these standards in our programs and to disseminate them widely to other humanitarian workers. Uh, my colleague who will be presenting today, Temba Sibanda, has been closely involved in the development of these standards since he joined the steering group in 2021. He was uh, selected, uh, invited to join the team to present a very much of a field-based approach um, because of his wide field experience. He's currently the chief of party with NRC's Activating Markets and Agricultural Livelihoods Project in Iraq, and he has more than 20 years of experience in emergency agricultural programming, food security, and livelihoods on a global scale. He's worked in Africa, Asia, Middle East, Americas, and Eastern Europe, so it looks like everything but Australia. Um, so he definitely has that perspective from throughout the world. His education was in agriculture with honors in crop science and also has a uh, MBA and a BA in development studies. So bringing that wide knowledge, I introduce uh, Temba uh, to, the, uh, to the group. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Uh, please, Temba, go ahead. Uh, can you connect us and continue to talk? Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Temba. We can hear you here. OK, thank you. Yeah, so from the practitioner's uh, point of view, uh, SEEDS is a good uh, companion uh, for implementing, developing, implementing, monitoring uh, crop-related uh, responses. As we all know, uh, any emergence in the developing world degenerates into a food security emergency. And it is important that we confront uh, these challenges related to food security in the third world through uh, tools such as seeds. So for us as practitioners, I think this is uh, a, a step in the, in the right direction. So for NRC, uh, we see this as a, a very good tool uh, for improving uh, program quality. You know, for a long time, as mentioned by others, the quality of the program depended on the managers or, or staff who are in that program without an acceptable, properly accepted uh, tool such as SEEDS. So I think this has come at the, at the right time and it will help us uh, even to standardize the crop related responses within our organization and across uh, the, the, the humanitarian world. We'll be using a set of uh, acceptable uh, standards which have been tested across uh, different contexts in Africa, Asia, and elsewhere. We see this as a key referral document for program de development. In many cases, when we, we develop proposals, uh, we lacked, especially for the crop-related responses, we lacked a, a document such as this, which we can refer to. Uh, now that this is in place, it will be easy for us to make reference to these standards, knowing pretty well that uh, these are uh, universally accepted uh, standards. Uh, we see it as key in the sense that it also emphasizes on the uh, evidence-based uh, learning. So this also gives us an opportunity uh, to push for more investments in evidence-based learning, uh, as we believe this will actually help us to improve uh, the quality of uh, our programs that, that, that we, we are implementing and those that we plan to implement in future. Uh, from here, uh, with the launch of the, the of the seed standards, NRC has developed an action plan of how we are going to make use of the, the seed standards. Uh, starting with the proposal development, from now onwards, all crop-related uh, uh, proposals will be guided by seeds, uh, right from assessments, implementation, throughout the uh, stages of the uh, uh, pro pro project cycle. Uh, seeds is also quite key uh, in making decisions uh, during emergencies. In many cases, uh, practitioners strike uh, when they are trying to make decisions about which response would be appropriate uh, and which one is feasible. 
with the tools we have, such as the decision trees in, in the season book, uh, it will be easier uh, for, for uh, practitioners to be guided and to come up with uh, uh, the most viable option through using uh, seeds and, and, and the tools that are, are part of the standards. SIS is also an important monitoring tool uh, for tracking the alignment of projects to the uh, minimum standards, as well as uh, the m and &E tools that are part of the, 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 the SIG standards. These will be adjusted uh, to ensure that we can effectively monitor uh, the activities that we are implementing related to the crop uh, 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 related uh, activities. Now, in terms of measuring impact of the crop related uh, crisis, we see, see it as being key uh, to guide both the project managers and uh, uh, the M&E people in terms of coming up with a good a, you know, aspects of uh, evaluation and monitoring that will identify the key issues in programming that show impact of the activities that we have been implementing. We are also monitoring a, a, a number of activities that we have been implementing mostly around uh, the construction related uh, Infra, the, the infrastructure that, that is related to uh, uh, crop related, uh, sorry. So the, the infrastructure that supports uh, crops in, in Iraq, for example, we are looking at uh, irrigation, which without uh, irrigation, we know here, this is a desert. It's almost impossible to produce crops. So what we are doing is we have SOPs uh, which guide the teams who uh, implement infrastructure related projects. Now, as NRC, one of the starting points is to align uh, these SOPs to the seed standard, looking at assessments uh, and planning, looking at technical specifications of the activities that are infrastructure related, like irrigation canals, looking at uh, the location, the lifeline, and then the timing of such activities. So these SOPs will be realigned with guidance from the seed uh, standards. And this process has already started and will continue until we have fully aligned our SOPs. Uh, now, one of the uh, key activities that we already focus on with the guidance from, from seeds is the training. We want to train implementation teams uh, to ensure that they are aware of the standards and that they apply them uh, appropriately. Uh, we know sometimes it's difficult to interpret reading these books. It might be difficult for, for some of the people to understand the, the, the standards, especially in some cases where we have issues with the language and stuff like that. So what we are doing is to do trainings, to roll out trainings, targeting key stuff. And then we are also looking at our partners who are supporting us with implementation of uh, the projects. We want also our partners to make use of these standards. Uh, like I mentioned earlier that we want to standardize uh, the operation, both from within NRC and those activities that are being implemented by partners. Uh, the, uh, one example that we have in terms of training and uh, alignment of our activities to seeds is the seed system strengthening project that we have uh, in uh, Ramadi uh, in, in Iraq. So for this project, we are already uh, aligning the approach so that uh, we are using the, the, the seed standards to guide the analysis of, of the seed system. We are also looking at building staff capacity training them, especially on the minimum standards 5.1 to, to 5.5, which relate to seed system strengthening, as well as st strengthening uh, the, 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 the uh, project on seed systems so that it's fully aligned uh, with seeds uh, from the seed system analysis right up to the variety choices uh, of the seeds. There is emphasis on, on, on community participation, and these are the issues that we want to learn from seeds and apply on the ground to improve the impact of our crop related uh, responses as an RRC. Uh, thank you.
thank you, Tembe and Aaron, for uh, from uh, NRC perspective, uh, and also as a committee member. Um, thanks, uh, Tembe, for presenting your views. And let me now ask the panel members to come and join us on the podium here on the seats. Uh, we'll we'll start the question and answer session. Uh, please, uh, Julie. Uh, um, Ian, Andre C. Um, yeah, well, um, do we have? Uh, let 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 me ask the uh, the online participants to go ahead and have your questions um, on the question and answer session of uh, the online um, in the on online chat area. Um, but before we start, I have uh, my own set of questions. Maybe it's it's been a wonderful uh, morning in terms of looking at different perspectives and also what the contents of the seeds and how we will be using them as we go along. Um, but Jan, you come from a, a donor perspective, as you said, and you are looking at it, uh, at the seeds and standards as, as a, a primary um, aid in kind of guiding your programming. Um, particularly, uh, how do you see that the current programs on the ground and also the future programs that you are thinking about uh, funding, uh, adapting to this kind of standards. If you can use the mic, yeah, please. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, thank you for that question. Can you see if the green light is on? Oh, oh, now it's on, sorry, yes, technology. Um, <laughs> No, thank you, Suresh. Uh, I, just before I answer that, I, I also wanted to give a big shout out to um, Andy Catley, who's not with us today in person, but I see he's on the, the screen. So thank you very much, Andy. It's been great working with you um, over the past couple of years as well. And uh, in terms of how BHA is looking to um, adapt our programming, there are several things that we've been um, doing. One, um, as I think has been mentioned several times by uh, the different speakers, is the uh, alignment between seeds um, and legs. And so we've already started, um, even just on our team, each of the uh, technical advisors now will be able to be completely um, conversant in both uh, of those types of standards so that we're not looking just at, at each of the uh, applications and proposals um, from, a, you know, separate, um, you know, well, this is the livestock piece and that's just the, the, the crop piece. So even having all of our advisors completely conversant in, in the standards of both, um, I think will be uh, helpful. And, and that's one of the things that we're doing. Um, of course, we have our emergency application guidelines um, from BHA. As those get updated, we will be incorporating um, the seeds links the same way as we have with, with legs and any of the other um, standards. And uh, just from another sort of uh, practical um, ex example of, of how we're, what Julie had mentioned earlier about the uh, infrastructure, uh, the you know natural resources and the ecology, and Tampa mentioned the infrastructure um, within uh, the the TPQ office, the Technical Program Quality Office, the uh, the three teams that make up the Food Security Livelihoods Division um, encompass all of those different areas. So uh, we're looking at at you know ensuring that uh, our infrastructure team. Um, is also applying the uh, same standards, for, especially when it's related to agricultural programming um, as what's in the SEEDS uh, booklet. Over, thank you. Yeah, thank you, and I'll keep, keep the mic with you there with the, among the among the panelists. Let me now move to Temba. Temba, you're still online, right? Yeah, Temba, now you yes. talked about how to work with the national systems, national ministries, particularly we would like to Kind of no, just to extend your, your presentation you had in terms of how are you creating awareness uh, among the policymakers or the ministries of uh, agriculture, for example, that you are working with, uh, and and then pro program and strategy development specialists, uh, in order for them to know what is in the content, co what is the content of the seeds manual, and also how uh, you are thinking about working, um, particularly start with Iraq and other countries that you've worked with. What is, what is the scenario there? How can we take this uh, from that perspective? Okay, thank you. So what we are planning to do here in Iraq is uh, we are planning to set up meetings with uh, the Minister of Agriculture. Uh, from from here, the, the Deputy Minister is quite key in, in all this, is both technical and, you know, uh, elite in terms of the policy. So we want to present the standards to, to the government and show them that this is the direction that we are taking as, as the humanitarian community. Uh, once that is done, 
hopefully we can then also get copies of the handbook. We, we know sometimes getting these resources within governments is, is difficult. So we share the copies of the handbook with them. And then once we have uh, marketed the seed at the highest level, then we will work with our teams on the ground in different uh, provinces, governors, to ensure that they share the guidelines also with uh, uh, the, the, the directorates of agriculture in, 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 at the lower level, so that they are aware of uh, these guidelines. Uh, one thing which we also want to do is to train uh, our, our teams as well as members of the uh, food security working uh, uh, groups, as well as the livelihood uh, working groups, so that they, they have the standards, they have the book out there, either downloaded or printed uh, uh, from internet, and this will help us uh, at least reach uh, those on the ground, the, the people who are you know, behind the action, uh, so that they, they have the resource, they can refer to it, and they make use uh, of the book on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is the approach that we were planning to take also globally within NRC, starting by training our practitioners, uh, sharing with them the, the resource, which is the, the, the book and, and the links. And then from there, they will approach the, the national government uh, ministries of agriculture uh, and explain how these, the, these standards are, are work so that they, they have access to the book and they can make use of it. Thank you, David. Uh, we'll we'll come, uh, stay there for us, uh, Temba. We will come back to you as more questions come in. Um, now, let me move to this room here. Um, just to raise, uh, you talked about how uh, various actors and players came together. It was a consultative process, and and um, um, of course, um, the the constituencies and and you know institutions have their own perspective on how to approach the crop emergencies. How were you able to bring them all together and different perspectives and and different views, and then accommodate that in the context of uh, preparing guidelines? Could you give us some kind of uh, kind of insight from that perspective? Sure. Thanks, Suresh. It was actually, um, from my perspective, from Seed's perspective, the inclusivity of all the voices that we heard during the development is actually something that we were intending to make the book more useful, more realistic, more based in reality than all of our organizations that we worked with have. The context, of course, across the world is extremely different, not just organizationally, but in every place that there's a farmer, there's a different type of farm from one kilometer to the next. So that diversity and bringing that diversity into the creation of the standards, we hope will you will see that there is a that that diversity actually makes it more useful. Um, so really, in the inclusivity, that was a, a key part. Also, I think there's a aspects of uh, there's an aspect of standards that we often confuse with. We confuse standards with being very rigid. Um, and in fact, standards allow and SEEDS encourages a flexibility and a focus on analysis, analysis of context, analysis of situations, analysis of your own organization and how you can apply it. So we really feel that the standards set a bar that allow you to see the best way to implement it for your particular organization and for each farmer's context. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Racy. That's that's very useful to know. Uh, Julie, moving on to you, um, you talked about agro ecosystem as one of the principles and and, uh, and we worry about that because in the context of fertilizers, particularly if you don't have chemical fertilizers that are readily available, uh, we need to build this soil system and, and the natural resource base for uh, emergency crop production. Now, in the context of degradation, soil degradation, it happens over time. There is a long term perspective. All of a sudden, emergency comes, and how do we get this long-term uh, effort in a short-term kind of thing? Um, just, just a confusion for the people who are thinking about how do we get this oil fertility right up back to, to normal within a one-year period where emergency hits are. In the context of emergency, give us some insights from there. Yeah, thank you, Suresh. Yeah, I, we often think we we know that land restoration is a multi-year long-term effort, and a lot of our development programs have generated this evidence that I mentioned in terms of in, increasing soil so, uh, water sources and soil fertility. So even CRS, we're struggling with this question of well, what can you do in the short term in a one-year 
emergency response project that can still support land restoration. Um, we actually have um, an interesting experience in the dry corridor of um, Central America where we have been able to introduce just an introduction of some of those practices to those short-term projects, um, BHA projects. Um, the important key thing, so it's, it's, it's an awareness raising of the um, participants of the program and the community members, but a key aspect of that experience has been the linkages with whether it's government extension or other systems that are kind of picking up from that introduction and that beginning of that process. So we're learning a little bit about that uh, in that area. In Niger, we're also looking at how we can expand land restoration efforts to a conflict affected area because we know an even unstable or, or fragile context, that's going to be a challenge. How can you introduce land restoration um, where there's conflict? But I think the key thing about SEEDS is that it forces responders to think about it. It's creating that standard, that principle. We need to consider what we can do in this context and make the linkages to the long-term efforts. And more importantly, with the participatory impact assessments, it can help us start generating evidence around what can we do in, in crises in short term that actually does contribute to the long-term land restoration? Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Julie, for that. Um, let's let's now come back to the room here um, in person and uh, we'll take some questions from here. Raise your hand if you have a question and we, I'll balance it between the online questions and in, in person from this point onwards. We have a hand up there at the back. Please introduce yourself, where you are from, who you are, and then ask the question. Uh, Jacob Watson with World Vision. And so question, it's more for Julie just based on what you're saying, but I, I would like for the other panelists as well. So you, you talked a bit about localization um, and how this is can fit into a localization strategy. So maybe just expand on that a little bit more and then thinking how we can be proactive in getting this information out to uh, LNGOs and partners and things like that, and then reflecting that capacity in, in our partners. Go ahead. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, so I think there are a number of ways and actually probably need to be doing it at a number of different levels. Of course, the most, um, the easiest is, you know, where we're working with local partners, we can introduce the tools and sort of take them through the training. But I think the critical aspect is the integration into those coordination mechanisms at the national levels as well as at the kind of local district levels. First of all, making sure our local partners are involved in those coordination platforms, but that we're using seed standards as a sort of tool within those coordination platforms. So, you know, our local partners are actually benefiting from the application of the of the handbook along with you know other actors so i think it's it sort of goes in in two hands like that okay there is one more hand thank you Julie. i'm going to jump in with an online question first because it's question. related yeah it's actually quite related yeah. the question is how feasible is it for smaller organizations to put these standards into practice what is the staff and financial burden of implementing them whom do you think that it should go I think probably for Racy, yeah. yeah okay. um, great, great question. Well, I think this also relates a little bit back to what I said in terms of standards and what they are. Um, the standard, let's think about standards versus SOPs. We do have the word standard in standard operating procedure, but standards, the standards, the minimum standards that are here are not standard operating procedures. So in terms of the costs of implementing them or how a small versus a large organization could implement, it leaves flexibility up to you to try to achieve the standard. So it's more of a process of considering your resources that you have, considering how you can be best placed in what ways and what specific standards to try to reach. You might try to reach certain standards sooner than you try to reach others because you're already on that path and have resources for that. Um, but minimum standards are, it's like we're seeking to attain them versus a set of standard operating procedures that says when you're doing this, you have to do this. So we are, in terms of the cost or how a small organization can do it, um, 
it's going to vary just as much as your projects vary across small to large organizations. It's just going to be a huge variation there. Um, for smaller organizations, I think take a take a look at the standards. Like I said, in terms of what are you already working on and what is already a priority for your organization and how can you capitalize on a direction that you're already heading to make you know, best use of those dollars that you already have in place. Um, you don't have the ability to make massive changes. Uh, see what you can, what you can take steps towards achieving. Ideally, we would all be achieving all of these minimum standards. They are minimum standards. They are not maximum standards, right? This is the minimum that we want to be achieving in our uh, crop related responses. So it's a continuum. Seek to achieve the minimum. If you get to the minimum, great, keep going. And that the it resources it takes to get to those is going to be different across organizations and contexts. Could I just add a couple comments to that? I just wanted to build on that by saying, it, again, it goes back to the question of coordination, that an organization shouldn't have to implement the seed standards alone, that if you are building them into the coordination mechanisms, the same way we do joint assessments in the event of a crisis, we can really pool the respective resources and capacities from across you know, the, the pool of actors. And, and that way, I think local organizations can can access resources in order to apply the standards. Okay, so let's take a question from the audience here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Saad Taha, Save the Children, Senior Advisor for Evidence and Learning. I am a farmer by DNA, not education, being an ilotic and uh, Nubian. So I'm very excited with what you did. Uh, and it is a great effort. In business, they say there is a long business tail. It means that there is a lot of opportunity for revolution and doing more. I feel that one of the challenges of the standards is always about awareness, not about knowledge change or uh, behavior change or practice change. So I believe there is an opportunity that we mainstream this uh, uh, standard and we need uh, to think about how ISO do things. For example, you have lead implementer and then you have lead edit, uh, auditor. Uh, seed uh, built to last, it will stay for a long time. It is not just a buzzword that, you know, people, it will be uh, 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 as the airs uh, exist. It is very critical. So we need to think about the long business tale, how we make sure that we mainstream it. Also, I feel the nine ministries, local actors uh, need to have such type of capacity. Even we need to think about educational system because I believe that uh, uh, students at agricultural college or uh, in crisis and prevention college need to be aware about and have knowledge, not aware only, have the knowledge uh, to deal, especially in vulnerable countries. So I will appreciate to know your thought about that. And uh, what is the next round of revision? Do you have uh, feedback log? And uh, is it planned to be uh, revised after three years or five years? Last is the importance of collection of local knowledge. It is very critical. My ancestors are farmers, and sometimes they give me a prediction like, you know, a looking crystal ball, you know. So local knowledge is very critical to capture also. Thank you. Thank you. Resi, you want to start that? <laughs> sure. Um, so in terms of the long, the relevance of seeds over time, I think is what you're saying. Let's make sure that it stays relevant and continues to learn from its application in the field. Uh, and many HSP standards have been revised over time's time. Seeds does follow very closely the LEGS process and LEGS has been around for about 15 years and has been revised. I think it's going into its third edition of revision. So certainly revisions are hoped for in the future and would be planned as as possible. Um, currently, there is a very great functionality on the interactive handbook platform, which is where all the handbooks are for HSP. And you can actually create an account and you can comment at any time on any handbook about any part of it that is or is not relevant to you. So that tool is currently not used a lot. It's very new. Um, but it is a tool that you have at any point to essentially say to the whole humanitarian community, not just me, because you can send me your feedback anytime you want to, but you can say to the whole humanitarian community, this aspect is really off the mark, or this aspect had this great impact from for us, and your comments will actually be visible publicly. 
Um, so that type of ongoing feedback mechanism is available immediately for any of the HSP handbooks. Um, so that's the most concrete way in the short term that we will collect feedback. Uh, in terms of local knowledge and feedback as SEEDS is being used, we have a number of field teams that have been with us throughout the development of the standards. And those field teams are just uh, our teams from different NGOs who are doing on the ground implementation and who have fed back to us at each stage of the process. We've come to them with questions and we've said, how does this apply to your context? So touch points of, you know, is this relevant? In a future phase, we would hope to expand those field team members, um, sort of like focal points, so that we could continue to learn from them. The ability for a local organization, whether it's government, a government agency, or a, a very local small implementer to be part of that process is, we would be thrilled with that. So that is another option. SEAS does not have a global team itself. We rely on our partners and stakeholders to tell us, hey, we've got a team in the field that would love to volunteer a couple hours a month to participate in discussions and feedback. Um, so we do rely on our, our partners for that to some extent. Thanks for the question. Okay, any more? Uh, just an online question there? Yeah, I have a couple of related yeah. questions from online, so I'll ask one of them. There are several that are similar. Um, how does NRC or CRS or, you know, others can also pitch in here. How do you intend to socialize seeds throughout its emer the emergency agriculture program globally? Um, it's always a challenge with standards, extending their use and adoption across countries and programs and various administrative levels from field to HQ. Maybe CRS perspective would be good to start with. Maybe we can go. And then maybe we can get Temba in, in yeah, too. Others who are in the room can also add. Go ahead, uh, Denise. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we've already started small. Um, RACI had just, um, uh, we have a, several communities of practice. So, RACI presented the seeds um, handbook and standards to our agriculture and livelihoods community of practice. Um, we've had some preliminary discussions um, between myself and our, pro our more kind of development oriented technical um, department with our humanitarian response department to say, okay, we need to talk to each other about how we start to uh, socialize these standards um, within, um, within, the, within our agency. Because obviously during a crisis, it's going to be critical for our HRD colleagues to be reinforcing the use of the standards. Um, but really in our country programs, it tends to be, you know, those livelihoods, food security, um, staff, um, will be involved in both humanitarian and development. So the next key thing will be, we've ordered some of the manuals, we're gonna integrate that into some of our, our trainings and orientation of our um, agriculture and livelihood staff as well. Very good, any more questions? Uh, okay, there is a hand there, if you can have the mic. Yeah, there. Wait, keep, keep raising your hand. <laughs> Uh, um, th these seeds and legs are expected to complement each other. So a lot of experiences from legs probably has gone it. Is there, like I was concerning, how effective has the implementation of, I know it has gone through several edition revisions. It has been around for some time. Is there any like comparison of pre and post legs in terms of impact of using and not using these guidelines? And were those learnings adopted while preparing these seeds? And are there agency, how widely is this legs being used across humanitarian agencies? And are they, which the, it has been quite a long time, are there any governments that have made legs, they have adopted legs as their standard practice? And that probably CRS and NRC are implementing this program across. I think they might share some learning on on the LEX implementation. And Good question. Uh, Can you introduce yourself? I don't know. Uh, I'm Srinivas Gautam. I'm from University of Notre Dame Poultry Institute. Uh, thank you, Srinivas. Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe we all should reflect on it. Uh, anyone to take, Rezi? Um, I'm actually going to see if, can we get Andy 
Kat Lee too. Andy is the principal investigator for Seeds. He leads the Seeds project. He's also been on the leg steering committee for 15 years, um, and I believe he's online. So I would like to send that to him because I can talk about how Seeds learned from the legs process, but I think he can speak to the whole question if it's possible to. Is to Andy online? Him. Can we check? He, just he to, was. Just to. Is he still there? <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? There he is. Ah, there he is. Okay, please go ahead, Andy. Yeah, thanks. I'll uh, I'll try and respond to the question about about legs. Um, I think first, firstly, the question is, um, has legs had any impact? Do you see any difference in in projects or programs where legs is implemented versus not implemented? Well, like seeds. Um, LEGS is based on the available evidence and we uh, conducted a big evidence review and there was fairly strong evidence on the livestock side that if you used certain practices and followed certain processes for a livestock project then you would indeed achieve a strong livelihoods impact. Um, whereas if you didn't do that, if you didn't follow that pathway, there was a high risk that those those impacts would not be achieved. And in going through that process, you know, we identified certain practices that were commonplace and perhaps even institutionalized on the livestock side that we were able to say, well, you shouldn't actually be doing this. There's very little evidence to support it. And if you look at it in terms of its its technical plausibility, it's weak. So that was the general um, experience, really, of the LEGS project and continues to be so, I think, over many years. Um, there has been huge uptake and interest in LEGS, which has grown over time. I don't have the figures to hand, but a number of donors use it uh, as a reference point, which means that it's used as a reference point in proposals. Um, and so on. Exact numbers are quite difficult to actually gather in terms of, you know, who's actually using it or not. Uh, because of the, you know, the huge variety of organisations and contexts that we that we work in. Um, you mentioned government, I think, has legs been incorporated in, into government? In different ways, I think, um, because some governments refer to humanitarian standards in their disaster management policies or equivalent policies. Uh, some governments have more specific livestock uh, guidelines for disasters. Ethiopia is an example where the, the Ministry of Agriculture published uh, national guidelines on on livelihoods based interventions in in pastoralist areas uh, which very much mirrors the legs approach and i think legs is is actually having much more of a concerted effort now to uh, to integrate these standards into into government policies but that of course is a is a very complex very complex job because each government has its own policy environment and policy structure related to disaster management and humanitarian response. These are different agencies exist in government. Um, so now those are a few thoughts and experiences from Lakes. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. That's useful as we go um, forward with seeds and, and how we can learn from the Lakes use and outreach and uh, advocacy of use of legs in the national systems, particularly on the livestock side. Um, take a look at, uh, it's a one way to look at it. You, you've given some insights, at least for me, to take a look at what are the strategies and policies on the livestock side that the, the governments which face frequent droughts have and how legs have been kind of incorporated in that and how the implementation comes out of it. So it's a good question, good answer. We'll follow it up in the context of uh, seeds. Um, any more questions online, please? I think actually Tembo wanted to jump in, I think, a little while ago. Tembo, did you have something you wanted to add to one of the questions? Tembo, please. 
Oh yes, uh, this is related to the uh, question on on, on legs. Uh, yeah, my own experience. I, I did a restocking program way back in 1999 when the, there was no legs. And yeah, we learned a lot of things from from that uh, restocking program. A, a I would say 40% of the livestock we distributed died, uh, mostly because we didn't have any standards to guide us. Uh, now, when I look at legs and reflect, I always say if legs was there at that time, we would have done the program uh, differently. Now, when I, I look at what we are doing now within NRC, if ever you mention livestock, then yeah, we want to see mention of legs. Uh, we, we want to see that our staff have read the, the, the guidelines and they, they are using the guidelines during implementation to avoid situations whereby you end up uh, losing some of your investments simply because you didn't follow the guides which have been tried and tested in, in different contexts. Uh, th thank you. OK, thank you, Tembe. Um, you have any more on I online? Do. I do. I have uh, another seven minutes to go, so if you can. OK, great. So this question is for Racy. Um, I think it's a pretty quick one. Will there be trainings provided by SEEDS? Uh, great question. We do have hope that in the future we will be able to roll out a series of trainings, both the training of trainers globally, as well as courses for donors or government agencies at a higher level who aren't implementing. Um, and just to also piggyback a little bit on the previous question, we did learn from LEGS um, that getting smaller local organizations to adopt standards is quite difficult if we rely on a training of trainers approach where we train the trainers and then they, in order to stay certified as LEGS or SEEDS trainers, need to go out and do trainings themselves. They often will do that for organizations that can pay them, which makes a lot of sense. So, um, or for whom they've are, they're already or, work, working with. So we also plan to have a series of direct trainings for local organizations. So we hope to have that in the second phase. So not just a training of trainers, but training of directly from seeds to local organizations um, to ensure that that localization happens and that they that we can get feedback because throughout in the training, of course, we'll learn a lot about what is very easy to then implement and what isn't. So we will get feedback from the trainings of the local organizations as well. So we do hope to do those trainings in the future. Uh, we don't, we are currently waiting on f funding. So for the moment there is, it won't be this year. Uh, may, it won't be this year. <laughs> okay, one more question in the audience here, please. Hi, I'm Amy Ostrander from the Famine Early Warning System. Um, so no longer on the implementer side, but a question from my past implementer self. Um, I can foresee that a lot of responses uh, would require engaging with multiple standards, right? So you may have instances where you're looking at agriculture and livestock and market-based responses, and that could be either overwhelming or confusing for your implementation team and your design team. So do you have recommendations for how um, teams might engage with and integrate multiple standards um, at the same time, especially if they're looking at three or more. Gracie, you can take it, or I can even ask uh, Jan. Yes, you said uh, legs and seeds should work together. Maybe <laughs> you should help us a little bit with that. Yeah. OK, I was also going to say Temba can give us the real world perspective um, <laughs> afterwards. But the intention when developing seeds, the intention was to not duplicate uh, and to ensure cross references where it was really relevant. This is particularly true for anything related to markets and seeds. So MERS already exists, the minimum economic recovery standards that already exists. We did not want to rep duplicate that. We did not want to duplicate anything that was in legs. So there's a lot of cross references in seeds. Um, I think where the real sticky, the the real challenge of integrating and using all of them comes is in the assessment stage, right? If we each of these has different ways that you assess, which one do you use? Um, we also hope Seeds hopes to address that in future phases by creating a joint assessment tool with legs, um, in particular, 
potentially also with MERS, like including them so that at the assessment level, there's at least indication of how how to make sure you're aligning your assessment such that you're going to get answers that help you achieve all of those minimum standards. So I'll stop there for that. I don't know if Jan or Temba want to add anything. Yeah, maybe Jan, you tell us a little bit about how just to combine legs and seats and, and we'll worry about those other things uh, as we go along. But Yeah, sure. Actually, I don't have too much more to, to add to Racy. She, she um, did that quite well. Um, but as I noted earlier, even from the donor side, the NDHA, you know, we're expecting all of our advisors on the agriculture team to be conversant in both. Um, we know that our partners, most of us on the team having been um, field implementers in, in the different NGOs for many years, um, it's, you know, the, the ag uh, program manager or livelihoods program manager that's doing all of this anyway. So it's not that they would go out and do a, a legs assessment and then a seeds assessment and then a MERS one. It really should be integrated. How some of those pieces come together, we're not, I think as a community practice, aren't quite um, sure about. Uh, I think CRS has some, some good examples how they're um, beginning to, you know, pull together these pieces because they've they've recognized um, some of these challenges um, in doing that. But seeds was we tried very, very uh, strategically to make sure that that we could align as much as possible with legs. Um, and, you know, that was very intentional from our perspective because we know that most of the, the beneficiaries that we're working with are uh, integrated programming already. You know, they, they are smallholder farmers that have some animals and have crops. It's it, even the pastoralists grow other crops, um, you know, so so make sure that it was, uh, you know, well thought through from the beginning. Um, we haven't quite reached there yet, and and it's it, it is a good question though. Um, Temba, over to you. Temba, okay, you thank to, you. Uh, say something about the integrated approach here with several standards. Yeah, th thank you. I think, yeah, um, one good thing is that it's, legs came uh, far much earlier uh, th th than seeds. So many of us are now familiar with legs. Now is the time to move on and familiarize ourselves with with, uh, with seeds. I think that also helps. But uh, in reality, you know, when you are developing an integrated program, I think when you look at seeds and, uh, and, and legs, for example, uh, it's important for agriculturalists to be familiar with, with both, they, they complement each other. They don't necessarily, you know, this does not necessarily repeat things that are already uh, on legs. And then when you design assessments, for example, uh, in the field, people tend to also specialize. Uh, our tools tend to be, for example, if I want to do a, an, even an integrated assessment, I will have sections focusing on, on uh, crops, that's where seeds comes in. I'll have a section for livestock. That's when legs ca comes in. I'll have another section on the economic situation. That's where uh, the minimum economic recovery standards come in. So while it's, yeah, it becomes probably difficult for the practitioners, I think on the ground, there isn't really much confusion because each standard focuses on a certain uh, area which is certain people collecting data maybe, for example, in an assessment, specializing in that particular uh, area. I think so far it should, it should work well. Thank you, Temba. And uh, I think we are close to uh, coming. And now we have um, uh, a session quickly on getting interactions, getting feedback from the participants. Before I, I, I turn it over to that kind of voting uh, from the participants. Um, just to summarize, there are a lot of issues that have come out um, from, uh, it's very difficult for me to summarize everything and I don't intend to do that, but outstanding issues are what are the evidences before we go forward? We, uh, what kind of evidences out there? How do we dig for evidences? How do we get the evidences out so that the not only standards that are there, even though they are minimum, they can be applied with the informed evidence-based application. So that's something that's coming out very clearly. And that requires a collection of data, collection of information as people implement programs, tracking them and, and using them, probably in the as in, in the form of case studies, for example, different context, different uh, uh, conditionalities, different agro ecosystems, and different types of emergencies that, that we face, right? So some, that's something coming out very nicely. And just uh, talking about how to integrate our, our standards, maybe, 
as we think about building capacities, we should be already thinking about how to integrate this uh, uh, standards because they're all out there uh, already, but maybe an integrated approach to building capacities, uh, maybe maybe just just my own thought here. Um, but that's that's uh, seems to be very useful once uh, once you develop uh, the seats capacity, legs capacity. At least that's what I'm getting from Timba. That when you actually are on the ground, people have in their assessments one paragraph about their own uh, aspects of it. But then when you combine it, you you want to have an integrated approach to implementation or designing the programs, and socializing these standards become very important. And and that requires knowledge sharing, awareness raising. And also a little bit of uh, reaching out to the policymakers, and that to show that the standards are here. When you come up with livestock policy, an emergency policy, or disaster policy, please consider this, and and in your own context, and and so on. That's the that's one one of the things that's coming out. And we mentioned about also curriculum. How do we develop the future uh, uh, humanitarian response uh, workers uh, and and also professionals on the ground? to include uh, them already well trained coming to the field uh, that's something that's useful indigenous knowledge was mentioned uh, local knowledge contextualization uh, and also taking this to the context um, and resi mentioned several times that it is not uh, standard operating procedure it is minimum standards to follow i mean that's a good message at least for me and build on it and and in the context of it. but then that again requires how can we build how do we de develop uh, evidence on different contexts and people are already working on the ground. The last point I want to make is that that um, something that I've been involved in uh, is climate resilient agriculture, you climate smart agriculture. There is a lot of uh, uh, innovations that are coming out, but needs to be taken to the field. And how does that uh, compare with the emergency responses that that we are talking about and how do we combine that in the context of shocks that uh, that we face um so with that let me stop here and turn it over to our colleagues um you you want to go for the voting um so so please all of you are online as well as in the room please take your uh, social media equipment that you have uh, device and go to um the website called menti.com some of you maybe are already familiar with um, menti.com and use the code that's 59079857 i'll give you a minute to get into the system for you and it's we are going to just get the feedback in terms of uh, uh, what you think so we have a question here just get in and if you have a second device for you to use it uh, that's also useful so you can observe the results while you are uh, using the device, first device. It, the scale goes from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And uh, uh, the question is, how likely are you or your organization to use seeds in your work? It's a very simple, basic question. Um, and it is 4.4 uh, so far. Yeah, very high score. They are likely to use it, strongly agree. Um, the average uh, is the one that we are seeing. Some people go less, some people go more, and, and so on. Is it okay to move to the second question? Yeah, using this device that you have in your hand. And the second question is uh, why? Um, to guide our partners in the project design and humanitarian, humanitarian livelihood assistance. The standards are critical. However, socializing, they're they're writing this this answers that are coming up. Um, standards are critical. However, socializing them across a large organization and partners will be a challenge. We talked about that already. Appropriateness. That's the context issue, right? Local context. Local. Um, someone is saying we have socialized seeds in our ag team during its development. Very good. Better inclusion of local agency, wonderful. So there are several issues, uh, several whys, answers to why coming up. We'll give a few minutes for people, folks to type it in. And maybe that will be useful for us as we collect these answers and, and pull them all together. So let's uh, close this now. Uh, we are coming to an end of this uh, launch session. Uh, let me first of all uh, say that um, 
you raise it talked about how do you get the standards uh, for you there are some copies out there uh, if you want to take um, i'm not sure how many copies but i should I'm, it should be enough for all of us in this room i think take one per per organization and if you want more you can always go to the seats um, website and download the free pdf um let's let's say that we all um, read and use seats as we go along in our organizations and our programming efforts um but at the same time keep in mind the issues that are coming up and we need to work towards uh, you know revisions and and giving the feedback uh, resume 